Hey, everybody, and welcome to Libromancy, a podcast about the magic of books. I'm Josh, and today I'm going to be talking about Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. And I have a special guest with me. It's Mike from the Cosmere Deep Dive podcast. Libromancy! <laughs> let's go! So let's, let's go. So let's go to space with the magic of books. Um, I, Mike, I really, really like this book. I was so glad that you suggested it. It was just a blast to read. How did, I mean, obviously you like it because you recommended it, but like, tell me about it. Why'd you pick it for me? Um, I mean, I saw it on your list, so it was already something that was on your radar. Um, but man, this is such a good book. And it's, it's kind of a genre that I don't really see much of lately. Like, I don't know, 30 years ago, you could, you could get pop semi-hard sci-fi anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. but but here lately there isn't too terribly much of it andy weir is kind of the the main name in the game right now yeah for just oh. astronaut adventure i guess there's uh mary cole she's doing it, some good stuff there she does have the uh the lady astronaut series which is quite fun i one thing i really liked about this and it's something that sometimes turns me away from other sci-fi is that it's it's too hard or it's like too hard as in too hard of a magic system, except it's science. And so if I don't know, I have to either learn all the science or I have to know everything so well. And I feel like in this book, in a, in a non-spoiler way, he teaches you about stuff without being like, this is everything you have to learn. It's so much like figure it out. If you don't understand, you're just wrong. I mean, how do you feel? Like, like you said, it was that, semi-soft, semi-hard kind of system of science, right? Yes. Okay, so this is this is one of Andy Weird's like really, really good strengths as a writer is he writes under the assumption that his audience is intelligent but not necessarily educated in like in like astrophysics, right? Mm -hmm. So like he gives you an he gives you a quick explainer about things of like, you know, this is this is how this thing works to someone who doesn't have like a, a science education background. Yeah, no, I liked it a lot. And I mean, I'm not a, a scientist, but I felt like everything that was explained to me made sense. And I could think, yeah, I think that is actually how it would work. I didn't I don't remember hearing anything and being like, well, this is just flat out you know, wrong or like conflicting with like what the layman me understands about, uh, you know, science. So. I mean, yeah, he, he fudges a few things from what I've, from what I've read from people who are smarter than me, who have also read this and like gone online to point out, point out stuff, but for uh, the most part. I mean, yeah. I think you have to just, I mean, part of it's going to have to just get faked or fudged, right? Because it's a story and, Sometimes the science in truth doesn't make for such a great story, right? But I, and like I said, nothing was so egregious to me that I was like, well, that's wrong. And maybe it was to them, but I, I don't know. I think it was, I think it was just the right level of uh, science. So, well, I've got a few questions about how some things work oh, that yeah. maybe we'll uh -huh. get into once we, once we break that spoiler barrier. That's true. That's true. Let's see. Is there? I mean, without spoiling it, our main character is. I, I don't know. I felt like he was great. Sometimes I felt that our main character was almost a little bit too good at a lot of things, but at the same time, it didn't feel too unbelievable. How did you feel about that? I mean, he walks a pretty fine line here because our our main character, whose name is not revealed at the beginning of the book, so it is technically a spoiler, so we won't go into that yet. Um, but our main character has to be competent at a lot of stuff. Otherwise, you know, the, the first problem that comes up, he just dies and we don't have a book anymore. 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, but there are definitely points at which he makes less than ideal decisions. And, and that, that gets talked about and explained about like in the book of like the circumstances that cause those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's uh, I, I agree. And I don't know if I felt like there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of good scenes and good, like one liners that were just, I mean, when I say a one liner, it's not like a joke one liner, but like there's these important parts that are just like almost summed up with like one, uh, like one line or something, or like a little bit of text. I mean, did you feel like his writing was, was really good? Does it less than he's done on other things? I mean, I, mean, I, f- I find this extremely comparable to The Martian, to the mm-hmm. point that I made an effort to reread The Martian in prep for this episode. I also watched The Martian, but that wasn't for any, that was just for me. Well, I mean, it's fun to watch The Martian, so I don't blame you for it, so. Um, let's see. I don't know. Do you have anything else you wanted to say in a non-spoilery kind of way? Or should we just get into some spoilers? Um, I mean, just sort of a general recommendation of like, if you enjoyed the Martian movie or book, uh, you'll you almost certainly you'll like this one. Mm-hmm. If you like mm-hmm. this one and you somehow haven't run into the Matt Damon, Ridley Scott on Mars film that is really, really excellent or the book that accompanies it you know check those out i agree and i think this is just a generally a fun sci-fi book for anybody to enjoy i think a lot of people would enjoy this even if sci-fi is not your your most favorite genre to read in so all right let's let's talk about uh some spoilers then just uh going on with this book Uh, our main character i have as an amnesia plot I thought this one worked really well. Just, it was well done, and I didn't feel like it was just contrived to be like, well, you can't know what's going on in the beginning, so you, your main character has to have amnesia, you know. But then as we learn more things, and then when we learn that final thing, that he did not come on the mission willingly, like, that was that was a pretty powerful moment. It was just like, but it worked because of the whole amnesia thing. How did you feel about the amnesia, Mike? Um it worked just fine for me. Like it gave, it gave Andy Mm -hmm. Weir an excuse to, to be like, okay, if I were in this situation, how would I perform a few basic scientific experiments to like work out exactly what's going on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like using, using simple tools and just like, you know, this, this is like some, some eighth grade science stuff right here of just like, You know, knowing how to do basic science stuff and then doing some simple experiments to then extrapolate information to find out, you know, things about your your surroundings. Yeah, and then and to apply it right. And uh, I like I, I like that he's like you know he's figured stuff out. He was still competent even without the amnesia. I, I was it worked really well for me, so I like that. I like that he's a. Uh, He's talking to himself, obviously, and he's like, because this is a single, well, it's mostly, it's a two-character book, basically, from our main point of views, right? But when he's alone and he's talking to himself, I, I liked, I like the cracks he made to himself. He's like, I like this, I did this. He's like, and I really liked kids. And then he's like, does that make me a bad person? He's like, oh, no, wait, I was a teacher. That's why I liked the kids, because I, I taught them all. So I, I laughed out loud at that part. Yeah, that was that was fun. Um, did you catch the pun? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. What which pun are you talking about? Okay, so our main character is Ryland Grace. Yes. And our ship is named the Hail Mary. Yep. So the Hail Mary is full of grace. Oh. You know, I did not, I did not f- figure that out. So that's a good one. See, that's another one of those good things that just is like little silly, like it's in there. I like it. I didn't catch it. No. I bet, I bet Andy Weir was so proud of himself for, for putting that one together. <laughs> uh, I bet so. I bet so. 
So um, let's see, you know, talking about Dr. Ryland Grace, how did you, I mean, he has uh, a majority of our book is uh, not a majority. Uh, a lot of the book has, has flashbacks of him and everything leading up to this with the, the astrophage. I mean, did you feel like the flashbacks were good? I liked them. I liked I, the characters in them. I mean, tell me about okay. it. Okay, I have I have a couple of very specific points to bring up here. Sure. So, first off, I would have liked to have seen some more of what happens on Earth after he leaves. Mm -hmm. And I'm irritated that we didn't get that, because we did get a scene that he isn't in. There is exactly one scene that he's not in, which then opens up the door to other scenes that he's not in, and then questioning why they aren't there. Um, but the there's a courtroom scene where oh yes uh, what's I her face I have, I have lost her name Strat S T R A T T Strat yes mm -hmm. where Strat is like getting sued by um I think every owner of intellectual property on the planet yeah uh -huh, uh -huh, yep yeah, every single one because she took every piece of technology available which was just I was like. I love that, that she's like, every media, every program, I don't care what it is, it's going up into space. Like, so awesome. Sorry, keep going. And, yeah, she she's like, all right, I'm giving you ten minutes to explain why I'm not giving you any further time, and then she just leaves. And Grace wasn't there, which mm -hmm. is the only flashback scene where he isn't there, where he isn't present. Yeah. And no, also I... it's it's kind of pointless because space is international waters and there's no IP law in space, so like what are they even complaining about? Yeah, well they're complaining cuz that's what they do. There's always people who resist, but I I agree. I wish we could have seen a little bit more of of Earth uh, afterwards after he sends the, the 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 little beetles back with the information to say, this is how to do it, this is how not, you know, just to see what happens. We know that the, everything, you know, they get it turned around later, but I really wish we could have seen just a little bit. Two scenes, three scenes, you know, see what's going on. Um, in regards to Strat, though, in the flashbacks, I really, you know, that's a hard principle for her to tow. I'm doing everything for humanity. There's no line I won't cross, there's nothing I won't, I won't break. But we have to survive this. And then her willingness to actually to do it, right? To pave the Sahara, make it into a huge solar farm, to get all the fuel to for everything. Just I mean, I was impressed with that. Nuking nuking Antarctica. Oh, I know. That was so crazy. I had that's one of my uh I felt so bad for that climatologist. That was one of my uh one of my good lines here. He put uh the climatologist, you know, he's the one, he orders it, right? He's like, you know, go ahead and blow it up so we can have this many years before it's too late. And he's like, and then he says, and he buried his face in his hands and cried. And I was just like, oh, that like, you know, there's this a little tug on my heart right there that he's, you know, he's a climatologist. He cares and he's like willfully destroying it to preserve, to preserve it later, right? Yeah, just, I mean... It's it's bad enough that they're doing this. It's that like she's making the top climatologist in the world push the button. Like, come on. I know. Uh, it's. I don't know. I mean, she didn't have to make him push it, but at the same time, it really drives it home that this is this is the end if it's not done right. And having him do that kind of signals like, I agree with this, even though I don't like to do it. So. Um, you said you had some more questions. What other kind of questions do you have for me? Okay, so like on a on a just how does this work basis. Mm -hmm. um, so the entire ship, like the walls of the ship, are lined with astrophage, right? Yep. Astrophage exists at a temperature of like ninety six point something Celsius, right? Right. How is the ship not cooked? They are a great insulator. I don't know. It's true. I yes. did not. <laughs> that, that is true. They are great at, like, they don't allow radiation through. But the problem with spaceships isn't 
um, keeping them like isn't that space is cold. It's that space is really hard to exhaust heat into. Hmm. So you know, like, I, I don't yeah. know, maybe just the outside of the ship has always been really hot and they, I don't know, but how do they force it to go one direction or not? Um, I don't know, because it is 98.6 or not, like 96 degrees Celsius, huh? So it's like almost the boiling point of water. Yeah, that's time. that's way too hot for humans. Yeah. Oh, maybe then, he just got confused that he meant Fahrenheit the whole time. <laughs> no, that's a joke. I get it. I know. Um, equivalently, and we haven't talked about this yet, but Rocky. Uh, yes. Rocky, as the ship's engineer, survived radiation poisoning by sleeping back by the engine where all the astrophages kept. Um, how did he not freeze to death? in a 96 Celsius environment when he's normally at, like, 220. Well, I thought it was somewhat explained that his ship is hotter than that. Like, much, much hotter than that. It's just... Okay, but, like... If the room you're staying in is filled with stuff that is always this temperature, like, the rest and... of the ship can can almost certainly, like, maintain this higher temperature, right? Mm -hmm. but you have all of these you have like all of this like temperature like heat sink basically right because it'll just absorb it until it's at that degree right yeah so and Rocky sleeps there and has done so for decades which was crazy yeah no you know you are right I did not I did not think about that when reading it but that is a little bit of a an inconsistency, huh? I mean, I just... I would have liked an explanation for it in the book. Like, somehow. Yeah, right. We've got really, really good AC on this spaceship that will keep it cold, that uses astrophage as its energy source somehow. So it's using it to keep it cool, but not, yeah. No, I don't know. And, like, the the Hail Mary, you know, the hip, the habitable parts are just like this you know, this cone, but there's also these, like, massive radiative fins that go out for hundreds of meters in every direction, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. No, I like... I mean, it would have been nice to learn about that, so... Hmm. Um, but, okay, so part of reading The Martian was to, like, get a compare and contrast between Rylan Grace and... Um, Mark Watney. Mark Watney, thank you. I am just, huh? I can't names today. Ah, names are names. That's all good. Um, so the biggest one is swearing. Hmm. Mark swears very casually and very frequently. Uh, the the Martian is is full of swearing. Like, I don't know. What's your what's your policy on on here? Do you work blue? Um, I don't swear. Uh, okay, so I'd then. prefer to keep it that way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll just make oblique references. Anyway, yeah. uh, Mark swears a lot. And right. Rylan Grace swears once. Yeah, uh-huh. And that's when he, you know, meets an intelligent alien species. Which, I mean, to be fair, that's a pretty unique experience. You kind of have to do something extreme at that situation. Yeah. Um yeah, so that's that's like the biggest thing. Um also uh, they went out of their way or they Andy Weir went out of his way to like make sure that none of the problems that Mark Watney dealt with are problems that um Rylan Grace, Grace had, to deal, had to deal with. Right. Yeah. Like like when when the issue of like he doesn't have enough food to make it back to Earth comes up. We immediately get like, oh yeah, I can't grow anything. None of this will grow. And just just immediately cut that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that he kept it. I mean, it helps keep it a lot more separate from the Martian too. So it's not, well, which one had this issue? Oh, this one's clearly this this book and this one's clearly, you know, the Martian with it. So. 
Yeah, and and like none of um none of Ryland's life support equipment was ever like ever even needed to be looked at. Right. Where where like Mark's stuff like half the book is him, you know, talking about his life support stuff, explaining his life support stuff. That's a good difference. I'm I'm glad that he did that. So well, yeah, it it would get repetitive. Like, Super it would have if if that had been the case. Like, then then this very very much would have been like a valid criticism. Like, oh yeah, it's just the Martian again. Like, just read the Martian again. Skip this one. Yeah. No, I like that. I mean, it's similar because it's one person stranded in space, you know, or somewhere for a while on their own. But then obviously we get Rocky and Project Hail Mary, and he starts communicating with the people of Earth when he's on Mars. So I, I mean, they, I get that they were similar, but still very different enough to be good, right? Yeah, they're they're different stories with like similar concepts. Yeah, exactly. Um, you want to talk about Rocky? Yeah, let's talk about Rocky. Rocky was great. He's a little OP because he literally built anything and everything they ever needed. But I was willing to overlook it because he was, it was good for the story. Well, somebody needed to be perfectly competent at all the things that they were good at because Ryland kept screwing up stuff that, that he wasn't good at. Right. Well, and they did need, you know, they do need an engineer, somebody who can do all the building because obviously you know, Ryland can't. We know clearly that that's not his skills or expertise. So, like I said, I liked Rocky. It was great. I loved, yeah, I haven't read the audiobook because I don't, I can't do audiobooks very well, but I did hear that for the musical notes when they're trying to communicate for the first time, it actually does play like little music in the audiobook for his his voice. That's cool. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that's, that was really cool. Like, and I loved I, I loved all the interactions in the beginning with Rocky when they're trying to figure stuff out. And he's like, I did this. And then he did the same thing back. And then I tapped on my thing and he tapped on his. You know, I just, I felt like them learning to communicate even was just very slow, but not, you know, slow, but not slow and like paced, right? But it still felt like exciting as we were learning and watching him, you know, start to communicate. I love it when he passes him a uh, tape measure. Through the <laughs> through the airlock, and like because it's just you know lines on a thing, like uh -huh. and Rocky doesn't Rocky can't see, so like Rocky can't tell what on earth is supposed to be, so it's a toy. Yeah, <laughs> he just pulls it and spins it back and stuff. It was that was so funny and learning that like oh Rocky can't see like he can't see see he just feels vibrations and can hear right. Like, that was so cool, figuring that out, of him being like, why am I putting, like, I have to put the clock closer for him? Like, why does that make a difference? And then, you know, I like that. That was so, so cool. Um, and I, I love the ongoing thing of, of, like, Rocky telling Grace that he was just, that he's bad at math. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> no, I, I did the math already for you. I already converted it. I'll convert things for you because you're bad at math. Yeah, uh huh. I love that. That was that was so fun. And I what was I going to say? I liked I liked Ryland or not Ryland's, but Andy Weir's choice to to use Xenonite because it's I don't know. It's something that like we're like people are familiar with, kind of you know, but we don't know how to work with it. But he can make it do anything he kind of wants in this book, even though it's a real element because. We just don't know how it works, or we don't have the tech, the capacity to make it work, right? I like that. Right. So I have the feeling that like the dangling a chain from space into atmosphere was was like one of the capstone scenes that he like imagined as he started writing this book. Uh -huh. And so like some of what we have works backwards from that. Right. So like we need an impossible material to make a chain out of that will withstand this, like all of these forces. So let's make an impossible material. Well, since we've got an impossible material, why don't we have 
all of Rocky's stuff made out of this impossible material. Since all of Rocky's stuff is made out of this impossible material, and this material is impossibly strong, why don't we have him make all of his like pressure vessels square, which is the worst possible design for a pressure vessel? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I can definitely see like the process working backwards from that. Yeah. Well, and and uh, you know, a little bit back to Rocky, you know, and him not being able to see like his species not having eyes, right? I like that they had a very limited concept of like radiation and like light in general because it makes sense like again from a layman perspective like if you didn't see and you couldn't know that there were lights and things that emitted radiation right then you would never like how would they even research radiation to know about radiation poisoning or that lead could block it and that astrophage could block it you know and so the well, fact they didn't know that i like that so i've read a little bit on this of like yeah. outside stuff like that it is largely unreasonable for that to work that way like yes they're not getting you know space based radiation but there are plenty of of just radioactive naturally occurring elements that unless they just don't exist on their planet somehow they had to have encountered at some point yeah i mean in my mind it would be like the way I guess I rationalized it a little bit there is that their planet was so unique that even if they did have like radiation on their planet, they wouldn't know about cosmic radiation or like radiation through space. And so to them, you know, like obviously they're not taking any of those radioactive things into space with them. So it wouldn't be an issue because they just don't know that it would be an issue, right? So. And had it been how... written that way, that would have been cool. Right. Well, you know, I'm I'm very good at going in after the fact and saying, here's how he should have written this, you know, and fixed this, but uh no. <laughs> yeah, this this is this is on par with like from the Martian of well what was on Mark's entertainment stick. Right, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> it's like, well I just I forgot to give Mark one because I wanted to make him complain about disco. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. Well, how did you feel about about Ryland's choice to go back and save Rocky and not go back to Earth? I mean, that's the only choice you can really make, right? Oh, I don't know. I was, I, I guess, I was kind of, I don't know. I was really like, what's he going to do? Because he really wanted to go home. But, I mean, he had been spending so much time with Rocky that he just had to, I mean, I know he had to go save him, like, because it's his best friend, that he's been the only person he's talked to in, you know, ages, so I mean, it's In just, over a decade of of outside of the ship time. Yeah, uh-huh. So, no, I, I just, I liked it, I just, I was like, ah, that was a, that's a tough choice. And then to choose to stay on their planet and not try and go home. I mean, obviously, I know it's going to be so different when he gets there and nobody he knows will be around. But I, I don't know if I would be able to do that. I'd be like, no, build me a ship and take me home. Like, please, I want to go home. <laughs> so. But, like, he's he doesn't have the programming ability to to, like, pre-program a route and deal with anything that happens on the route that he would no. have to be comatose for. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They certainly don't, because they don't have computers yet. Right, and they have insanely long life cycle, lifespan, so it wasn't an issue anyway for them the first time, you know, to Tau Ceti. So. Although I suppose they could just, like, put him in a coma, or not even do that, just, like, load him up a bunch of food and give him a little, give him a section with you know, all the entertainment he brought with him. Yeah. He has guess, every video game ever made. I don't know how that works, but apparently he does. And super good emulators. So I'm sure. Right. So no, I guess I was like, with all the entertainment that he'd have that they built in his little enclosure, like, I guess it's not really that big of a, an issue for him. So like, they, yeah, they could have had like an Iridian crude ship 
that he didn't have to go comatose for. Yeah. Hmm. yeah so I no. guess they could have done that. Eh. <laughs> no, that's true. I like that. I like that Rocky did have some. He had some real mechanic speak. You know, this this uh, this bolt can't be tight if it's a liquid. You know, I'm just gonna melt it off. It can't. So I like that. It was uh, it was pretty funny. Yes, there were no, there are a lot of fun scenes. Um, so my other major issue with this book, yeah, and okay, I would like to make clear at this point that all the complaints I've had are the only complaints I've had. This is an excellent, excellent book. Like in everything, I'm not complaining about. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, oh no, I get it. There's there's a lot of good for this book and just a little bad. Uh huh. Uh, so yeah, my other primary complaint about this is um, NASA loves procedures. Procedures for everything. Everything written down step by step. This is how you do every single thing. NASA loves procedures. Mm -hmm. There are no procedures on this spaceship. <laughs> wow, well, I mean... Maybe there's none that we know of, but uh, two of the three people did die in transit, so. Okay, but somewhere, and and very, very obviously should have been, like, something of, like, on this computer is all the procedures for all the, all the things that we think you might have to do. Because mm -hmm. if NASA is even slightly attached to this project, they would make sure that was there. Yeah. No, I, I could see it. Yeah. Procedures. Yeah, he didn't do that very many things by the book that he didn't have, did he? He didn't have a book? He didn't have a book. He had no book. I don't know, I don't know why his procedure would have been like, hey, if you encounter an alien life form, here's how to earn its learn to communicate with it in five easy steps. <laughs> I mean... Maybe, if, right? If you don't think NASA has a a written procedure from that from, like, 1953. Yeah. We should probably update that that uh, that book. You know, 1953 to 2022 is a, a big gap. Lots to change in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's, like, some updates that need to happen there. But, but <laughs> like, if you don't think NASA already doesn't have a procedure... For that, for like an alien encounter, come on! Yeah. Of course they do. Of course, yeah, they do. They have to have a procedure for everything so that it, it all will work correctly. And yeah. I was, uh, I was glad that there was only one awkward sex scene in this book that probably could have been cut out. But I mean, if he had to have it, it wasn't that bad of a scene. So, I. <laughs> That was comedy gold, my friend. <laughs> it was pretty funny. It just was a little, like, out of the blue. That's all. So <laughs> Okay, so either Dubois is, like, absolutely straight, no comedy whatsoever, or he plays up how, how like, straight-laced he is and is laughing his, his butt off inside his own head all the time at everyone. Oh, I mean, I, either way, it's hilarious. It, his whole everything is hilarious. Either way on that one. So, I don't know. Which one do you think he is? Do you think he's more actually straight-laced like that, or he's uh, faking it for everybody? Uh, I feel like he's he's laughing at people. He's got to be. He's got to laugh at people, yeah. Now, that was... Uh, that was interesting. Okay, here's a here's a question for you that I had. Uh, you're going up into space on this suicide mission. What's your preferred method of death? Are you going to go with nitrogen? Did you want to do drugs or the gun? Or whatever else you want to do. You know, um, hmm. I kind of want to go nitrogen and drugs. So I've already decided that should I live this long and like have the economic ability to do so, once I'm retired and have no responsibilities, I would like to try recreational drugs that I haven't already tried yet. Mm -hmm. Like, that seems like the best time for it, right? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, no responsibilities. You're on your own. You're you know taken care of. So makes sense to me. Um. So so like yeah. In in a situation where like I know I'm not coming home. I'm not living through this. I don't want to die of starvation or radiation poisoning or any of a dozen other ways that space is trying to kill me at all times. Yeah, man, I would I would like to try heroin a few times before I go, but I don't know that I'd necessarily want to overdose so right. much as like after I've gotten high a few times and really gotten to enjoy that nitrogen myself to death. Right. Just hook up the nitrogen and uh Breathe until you can't no more. No, I think, I don't know, I would want to do, if I had to, I'd probably pick the nitrogen or some really unique way that would kill me, like, instantaneously. So, like, so I'm the first one to ever die that way, right? Like, I mean, trampled to death by a thousand topless women isn't really an option in space. No, unfortunately, it's not. But I would, I could pick, like catapulted at the speed of light into the sun or something right like or i don't know like we want to pick one that doesn't hurt too bad because yes i am i don't like pain and i would love to just skip it so i would do nitrogen or something incredibly unique that would kill me instantly you know like walking into rocky ship would pretty much kill me instantly right oh but that'd be that would be painful that's it it would be painful but i mean it's only painful for a few seconds but oof I don't know, but well, it's that's what I'm saying. I, I'd want to do something that was unique and like the first one, just so I get to be the first one who did it. But I'd probably just end up going with the nitrogen. Oh, hey, um, are, you're familiar with the concept of Chekhov's gun, right? I am. Mm-hmm. Did Did you enjoy the use and not use of Chekhov's gun in this book? Uh, I think so. Why don't you tell me which ones you thought they were, and I'll tell you so, if I enjoyed it. The use was nitrogen, right? Like, the only reason nitrogen's on the ship is is because of this, you know, this thing that was set up earlier of how do you want to die? Mm-hmm. But the other thing that was also mentioned was there's a physical gun that is brought up earlier in the book and placed prominently on a mantle, and we get to look at it, and then we never <laughs> use it. No. Never. I, I I liked it. I think it's good to sometimes subvert those uh, obvious things and sometimes to use them the way they're meant to be used, right? So I liked it. I, I just, I really liked this book. I felt like the pacing was just on point. Like you learn things at the, just the right times to make critical, like the way you, you feel about Dr. Ryland changes every time you learn a new flashback. And then the story keeps progressing at the right speeds. You're always just like, this is so exciting. This is so exciting. What's the next thing they're going to do? And then it ends and it's really good. So, Can you imagine what his students thought? Like, he's gone for a few days. He comes back. He starts teaching and then just runs out and they never see him again. Right. And it, well, I, what you have to wonder if, like, I don't know how much Strat was pushing, like, the information out of who's going up, right? But I like, mean, I'm I'm sure they found out that that he ended up being on the crew, but yeah, no, but true. He was just like he was there. Some men came and talked with him, <laughs> and then he came back and like left one day. Just I mean, out of the blue, yeah, yeah. Quiet study time. I'll be right back, and then he doesn't. <laughs> Never ever comes back. No, I loved. I like that. I liked. I liked all the experiments too. Sometimes I'm not a big fan of, uh, like I said, like hard science fiction experiments in books because they can sometimes turn tend to be a little dry. But I never; these ones were all so well put together and not dry or boring. How did you feel? Did you feel the same? Yeah, uh, I mean, in in the cases you're mentioning, it's almost always like the author learned a thing and wants to wants to share what they learned, right? Mm-hmm. Like I did. I did, you know, 30 hours of research for this. You're getting 10 pages on it. Yeah. I mean, I can, you could almost feel, like, the excitement uh, from Dr. Ryland, you know, as he's figuring that stuff out, right? Did you, I got swept up in it sometimes. So, setting aside the, the whole sun-eating portion of Astrophage, how <laughs> cool is Astrophage? 
Yeah, so cool. I mean, it travels at what near the speed of light. It stays at a constant temperature no matter what, and it's directable. <laughs> like, it's it's a it's a perfect energy source. Yeah, able to translate things from mass to energy perfectly. That was, I mean, it was just it was a it was a brilliant antagonist for this story, right? Because it's not something you can negotiate with, but it's not evil. It's just doing what it does. Yeah, it was awesome. And and it would be a perfect solution to climate change if yeah. it weren't causing catastrophic, the opposite direction climate change. Yeah. So do you think they, uh, I mean, the goal of the story, right, to go figure out how come Tau said he's not uh, getting destroyed by the astrophage as well. He, they send it back. The uh, I don't remember what it was that they cultivated to eat it, right? Or that was eating it, and they cultivated it for nitrogen-rich environments. Tau Miba. Tau Miba, that's right. Do you think on Earth they would have just released the Tau Miba and let it eat all of the astrophage? Or do you think they uh, they would keep it in, in check? So they could still like harvest the astrophage or just keep the astrophage separate. Well, they had to release it on Venus. Earth has way too much nitrogen in its oh, atmosphere. Oh, you're right. They released it on Venus. So it, it, ignore my stupidity for a second there. Um, the bulk of our of the air that you breathe is nitrogen, like by a by a large margin. Yes. So. It's, no, so do you think that uh, Earth is still going to use the astrophage, though? They're going to make it a better yeah, energy what, source? And... There's there's literally no reason not to. They've already paved over a third of the Sahara to to basically be a power plant for the world. Yeah. Like, without any sort of technological advancement, Ryland was already, like, guessing at, you know, you get a vial of astrophage and it powers your house and your car and your own private spaceship for your lifetime plus a thousand years. <laughs> it is pretty great. So I wish, I mean, if we had some astrophage aside from the, you know, sun eating aspect, I'd, it'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. I mean, it, it would, it would basically revolutionize anything involving power or fuel Anything? Anything. Yeah. And anything and everything. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I mean, I think I've pretty much talked about everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up about uh, Project Hail Mary? Uh, not really. Just really, really good book. I've read it three times now. Enjoyed it every time. Um, oh, there's... There is a movie theoretically still being worked on. That... Oh, that's, that's really exciting, actually. I, that's, a, that's really good news. I like that. Okay, so just because it's um, Andy Weir, uh, the rights for this were bought up before the book was published. Um, according to IMDb, we have... Attached to it is Ryan Gosling. Um, okay. So, like, he's he is personally attached to this movie at a star and producer level. So, like, oh, he, wow. he's the primary force driving this being made. You know, um, I don't direct... think it would be crazy difficult to even produce this. I mean, a little bit, but not, not insane on a budget-wise, I can't think. Sorry, keep going. I mean, like, most of the... Okay, so like most of the scenes are going to be filmed in in like the single location of you know the interior of the Hail Mary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. you'll have like two versions of that set of like pre Rocky installing his hamster tubes and post. You're you're going to have like you know some some um, special effects heavy shots, of course. Right, like obviously Rocky is be CGI or practical effects, you know, get some good CGI shots of a spaceship approaching planets or the sun, you know, the suns and such. Astrophage, I'd like to see Rocky but... done, I'd like to see Rocky done practically, like make him a puppet, make him like a really good puppet. I think it could be done really well. I mean, 
Jurassic Park was done excellently for its time. And I think we can only say we've gotten better at it. So I think it's totally doable. But, but yeah. Um, oh, and then the directors, and this is my favorite part. I have no idea if they're still attached, if it, if any movement has happened on this in like five years, whatever. Uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Are you familiar with Lord and Miller? I, I'm not familiar with anything like that, unfortunately. Okay. Have you seen uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? I have. Have you seen the Lego movie? I have. Have you seen Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse? I have, yes. Have you seen 21 or 22 Jump Street? <laughs> uh, yes, I have. <laughs> uh, See, what else have they well, that's done? That's a pretty good... Mitchell's uh, vs. the Machines. Nope. Nope, I can say no on that one. I also haven't checked that one out. There's, that's a pretty good uh, set of movies there that, I'll, that I, all, I enjoyed all of those, so... That's, that's good hope. That's, good, that's a good promise for that. But, yeah, like, them being attached to this movie is extremely promising. Um... Have, I mean, I'm sure it doesn't have any kind of a release date out by now, right? Oh, God, no. And no. I'm sure, like, COVID completely stopped anything that they were working on dead, but... I'm sure for a little while it has, yeah. Uh, let's see, what else? What other director credits do they have? Uh, they worked on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. They had an Apple TV series called The After Party. Hmm. Um, they did a, an animated show on MTV back in 2002 called Clone High that very few people are familiar with, but I loved it. Yeah, no, I haven't heard of that one at all. That's... Mm -mm. It sounds like they have a good... They have a lot of good uh, things under their belt, so it makes me confident that it will turn out the right way. Maybe a little bit more humor -y, but this is, it's got a lot of funny parts in it that they could easily use, so I, I don't think that yeah. would actually be that much of a problem. Oh, they were also uh, the directors of Solo before they got fired and replaced by um, what's-his-face, that one guy, Ron Howard. I never saw Solo either. I'm a bad movie watcher. I've seen, read a lot more books than movies. So. I would love to see like their version of the movie because the I didn't really care for the final one. I know there's people out there that really liked it, but I didn't really care for the for the final cut of of Solo. I think I would have preferred a Lord and Miller cut. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'd be excited to see it too, even just from hearing those other movies they worked on. So, um. All right, Mike, uh, you are from the Cosmic Deep Dive podcast. How can people you know, follow you and, and hear your great podcast? Um, well, the so we're on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I never post on Facebook except to just announce new episodes, so don't bother with Facebook. Like, even aside from, from my stuff on Facebook, just don't bother with Facebook. Uh, but Twitter is at CosmereCast. We also have a Discord, and you can find the link to that through our Patreon of patreon.com slash CosmereCast. And yeah, those are those are the best. Those are the best ways to do that. No, I'm uh, I'm listening through to you guys still. A lot to catch up on, but I am enjoying it. So. Oh yeah, we are on the recording end. We are almost done with Oathbringer, and we've been doing th these books in release order. So Release order is a great order to do them in. We we have recorded a little over two hundred episodes. Wow, something to aspire to on my end for sure. All right, everybody, I think that's going to wrap up our discussion of Project Hail Mary. Um, thanks, Mike, for coming and talking to me about this and uh, getting me to read it. Well, thank thank you so much for having me on. Um, we'll need to get you on a on a guest episode of of something Cosmere deep divey. Yeah, I'd love to. No, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks to David Hillowitz for the intro and outro music. Of course, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. It uh, always helps us out a lot. And remember to journey to space with the magic of books. <laughs> <laughs>